Good morning and welcome to Bridgepoint Church. My name is Adam. I'm the associate pastor. And whether you're joining us in person or online, we are thrilled that you're here. There's a lot going on and I can't wait to get you caught up on what's going down at Bridgepoint. <laughs> As you came in, you probably thought, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. That's because we are kicking off our Angel Tree. Angel Tree is something that we do every year, and it's an opportunity through your generosity to rally around families within our own church and military families and provide Christmas meals and Christmas gifts for their families. If you're interested, you can head out to the Angel Tree table in the lobby. Ladies, if you've been looking for an opportunity to jump into a women's group, we have a perfect entry point. A bunch of the ladies groups are going to be starting off a Christmas Advent series that's gonna take you all the way up to Christmas. If you'd like to be involved in those, you can go to the Church Center app or go to bridgepointchurch.com and you can sign up there. This is for all our middle school families out there. We have a winter retreat happening December 3rd through the 5th up in McCall so the kids will be able to play in the snow and it's just $95. You'll wanna make sure you get your signups in soon because spots will fill up. You can go to the Church Center app and sign up there as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're new to Bridgepoint, either watching in person or online, we would love to know that you're here so that we can send you a gift. All you have to do is grab your phone and text the word GUEST to the number 208-826-4433. Fill out the prompts that it sends you and we will give you a Dutch Bros gift card in the mail. If you call Bridgepoint Church home, one of the things that helps us take very good care of you is when you grab your phone and text the word HERE to the same number, 208-826-4433. And lastly, if you want to be in the loop, in the know for what's going on and get text updates, you have to text LOOP to the same number, 208-826-4433. Thank you so much for watching. Like we said, there's a great service in store for you. In fact, we are in week two of our Samson series, but let's begin by worshiping together. Good morning. I can think of no better way to start the week than singing together and worshiping. Let's stand and let's fill this house with the joy of the Lord. God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord.
when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot you have told okay it is well with my soul no matter what happens God's got this but it's another thing to believe it and to know that through his faithfulness and his goodness that we live in that place every single day this next song talks about the goodness of God and how that is where we live that's the path he created for us and no matter what's happening around us the chaos the madness that might seem to be happening in our world God has a good plan and that's where we live. Let's sing again this morning. All my days 
been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath your faithfulness is everlasting. Lord, I just thank you that we're all here this morning and we're together and I just ask that you would open our hearts to hear from your word. And then as we leave here this morning, we take your goodness and we shine your light in our community. We love you, Jesus. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Hey, good morning, everyone. I got to tell you, it's really great to see uh, all of you here today. Went out in the parking lot, and man, the parking lot looks full. That's awesome. Glad you are with us. And uh, if you're joining us online, I'm really glad you are with us as well. So I'd like to take your, for you to take your Bible. Let's look to uh, Judges, Judges chapter number 14. And uh, while you're turning there, last Thursday was the 11th day of the 11th month. And on the 11th day of the 11th month, we 
honor and celebrate those who are veterans. And so for those of you that have served, we can never thank you enough. The fact that you and I are able to gather here today is a result of the sacrifices of men and women throughout the history of our nation. And um, as a nation and as individuals, we owe you and your families a debt that we can never repay. But today, we just want to thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your the families who have have family members who have served as well. And uh, can we take just a moment and thank those who have served on our behalf that allow us the freedom that we enjoy. So thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate you. Now, uh, we started a sermon series on Samson, and what we said about Samson, just big picture, is that when you think about Samson, what Samson is is a cautionary tale. The idea behind Samson is not just to give you some history about this guy named Samson, but it's actually for us to take a look at uh, what happened in his life and then be able to learn some lessons uh, from his experience rather than have to learn lessons from our experience. You know, not every lesson that we learn has to be learned the hard way. Every once in a while, we might be able to learn something from somebody else's hard way so that we don't have to go through the same thing. And that's exactly what this is. And we used uh, this picture as kind of an illustration of the entire story as a traffic light. And so uh, this traffic light, it is uh, more than just a series of three lights. It is actually a symbol of authority. This is telling you what you can do or what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. You can go, have caution, and stop. But when it comes to it, you make the decision on what you're going to do. So uh, <clears throat> we found out last week there's a bunch of people in this very room that have run red lights, right? You know who you are. And it's me too. We've all done that, right? So we make a choice in regard to what we're going to do. But <clears throat> when it comes to this, Let's, uh, let's learn something from the life of this individual by the name of Samson. So big picture, let's look in Judges chapter 2, verse number 16. It's just some background. And it helps us to understand uh, where we're at, what's going on in Judges chapter 2, verse number 16. Then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. So in a period of about uh, 350 to 400 years or so, there were 12 judges that God raised up to deliver Israel uh, from their attackers. Now, they needed be, to be delivered because they had gotten themselves into a mess. And we talked about this last week in regard to this, just this cycle uh, of sin. And this is pretty simplified, but it's actually pretty good, right? Israel does good. Israel does bad. Israel gets punished. Israel asks God for help. God sends them a judge. Israel is saved. Israel does good. Then right in here is like Israel forgets God. Then Israel starts to do, and here we go. And it is a cycle that just goes on and on and on. And I don't know if you've ever read through the Old Testament and you're just coming across this story time and time again, and you're just going, Israel, What's the deal? How come you don't pay attention? How come you don't learn? When are you ever going to do something different? And the problem with being critical about Israel is that this can be our story as well. We can, we can do the very same thing. I'll bet you, I know I've done it. I'll bet you have as well. <clears throat> Some circumstance happens, something, and I'm going, oh, I don't know. And, you know, and, and then as the situation passes, I'm going, I thought I've been a Christian for a while. I should have known better. Where's my faith? And you, you, you know, you just get caught up in that cycle. Now, uh, we go through a very similar struggle. So well, let's come out of the Old Testament, go in the New Testament for just a second, because I want to draw your attention to Galatians chapter number five, verse number 16. 
It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Now, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, then you were given a new nature. And the Holy Spirit lives within you. But even though you've been set free from your sinful nature, we all still have a sinful nature that craves things. Every single time I drive by the intersection of Eagle and Fairview, <laughs> there, and it's got red lights in it. And when those red lights are flashing, I know it's the devil. <laughs> and it's the Krispy Kreme donut shop where Krispy Kreme donuts, when that red light is on and that means those things are fresh, I can eat an entire dozen. How do I know that? It's not theory. <laughs> oh, Becky's not here today. Oh, there she is. All right. Okay. So let's look at the next verse says. The sinful nature wants to, to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. So there's a struggle. There's a struggle within all of us. The apostle Paul says in Romans, he says, the things that I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. And the things that I want to do, that's what I'm not doing. And he ends up concluding that section of scripture by saying this, oh, sinful, wretched man that I am. So we struggle. And if we're not careful, what will happen is that we will be on this cycle that the nation of Israel found themselves in, or what will happen is that uh, we won't heed those red flashing lights that God has placed in our lives, and it will lead us to a place that we don't want to go. Now, here's a quote from A.W. Tozer, and I read this, and I was convicted by it, and so I'm sharing it with you today. In every Christian's heart, there's a cross and a throne. And a Christian is on the throne until he puts himself on the cross. If he refuses the cross, he remains on the throne. Perhaps this is at the bottom of backsliding and worldliness among gospel believers today. We want to be saved, but we insist that Christ do all the dying. No cross for us, no dethronement, no dying. We remain king within the little kingdom of man's soul and wear our tinsel crown with all the pride of a Caesar, but we doom ourselves to the shadows and weakness and spiritual sterility. Yike. So, this is not the way it has to play out. And it didn't have to play out this way in Samson's life, but there has to be some decisions that are made, right? So you're there in Judges chapter number 14. Let's start in verse number one. We're picking up the story here. It says, and now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. And so what has happened is that uh, between uh, the end of chapter number 13 and now the beginning of chapter number 14, some time has passed. And here Samson is this uh, young man who uh, for all of his life has been living out this Nazarite vow that he was given at his conception. Even before his conception, the angel of the Lord told his mother that that's what was going to happen. And so in living out that Nazarite vow, it means that for all of Samson's life, he has had nothing to do with grapes of any form, no grape juice, no wine, no, bra uh, no uh, raisins, none of that. Uh, he has had nothing to do with anything that is dead, and he has never received a haircut. And so all those things combined makes it very obvious in Samson's life, and everybody who knows Samson, that he's different, which is exactly the point. The point is that he has been set apart for service. And so there is Samson. And what we find is that uh, uh, Samson... Uh, he is going down to this city, which is about six miles away from the city of Zorah. And let's look in verse number two. 
So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. And so Samson goes down to this Philistine city. He sees this woman. He then comes back to his uh, mom and dad. And here's what he says. Um, get her for me as a wife. Now, I'm just thinking that if anybody uh, is ever considering to use this line uh, when it comes to uh, an engagement, you might want to pass. But what helps us to understand is that the marriage customs back then are not the same marriage customs uh, that we have today. So here's the marriage customs. Take a look. It's this. It's arranged marriages. That's why Samson, I mean, he's gone down to... Uh, the city sees this woman, comes back to his mom and dad, and says, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to arrange this marriage, which means uh, his parents, and primarily his father, has to, to go down there and uh, have a, uh, and a like, it's almost like a business contract, a negotiation in regard to, with the, the father of this woman, and hey, here's what the dowry is, and here's what it's going to look like, and all that stuff. Let me take a quick time out right here. And one of the reasons why this just sounds awful, because it is, is because back in this culture, women are property. And that's how it's viewed as. And one of the great things that the gospel does, one of the great things that Jesus Christ does, is he, he elevates everyone to their proper place, to the place that God had intended everyone to be. And so uh, there is this arranged marriage, and now there is this. It's a betrothal time of 6 to 12 months. So you go, you make this agreement, and then this uh, um, man and woman, they are officially considered husband and wife, but they don't live together. There's this, uh, you, I mean, you could call it an engagement time. It's not quite the same, of course, but there's this time where they're separated. So she is uh, there with her parents. Uh, he is there with his parents. She's making all the preparations for the wedding and for uh, being his wife, and he is doing the same as a husband. He's you know, primarily building a house and getting those things uh, ready as well. So the bride stays there with her family, and then uh, the groom arrives for the bride. She does not know when that is going to happen. This is a surprise, and it's meant to be a surprise. And so the groom arrives for the bride. I wish we had a little bit more time just to talk about this. Not only are you familiar with this when it comes to Mary and Joseph and their betrothal and that story, but I wish I had more time to, think, to talk about how that the groom is going to arrive for the bride unexpectedly because that impacts all of us. There's coming a day when the groom is going to arrive unexpectedly for his bride. And that is going to be a great day. So the groom arrives for the bride, and then here's what happens. It's a seven-day marriage feast. Now, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because that's going to uh, become important in just a moment. So it's a seven-day marriage feast. At the end of the seventh day, then the bride and groom are then... Uh, go and have their honeymoon, and they are husband and wife. So that's what's happening here. So um, in all of this, <clears throat> we've talked about how that God had placed these warning lights in Samson's life. God places warning lights in our life. And I want to give you this first one. In Samson's life and in our life, look, we have war the warning lights of people who love us, people who love us, people who are willing uh, to tell us some things. And here's what Samson's parents are telling him. It's in verse number three. Then his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all of my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? So what, are, what their parents are telling, what are, his parents are telling him is it Samson? This is a bad decision. This is not what you should do. The big picture here that everyone knew that they were not supposed to marry outside of 
if you're Jewish, you're supposed to marry someone who is Jewish. And the main reason for that is because the Philistines and those who are around, they don't worship the true God. They worship false gods and idols. And when there's this inner mix, it causes nothing but problems. And what Samson's parents are saying is absolutely right. And it needs to be said. There are people in your life and in my life that God has placed in our lives to be able to say some things that, uh, that we need to hear. Because there are people that, that love us who will tell us the truth. There are friends that you have, if they love you, how many of you, you've had a friend tell you the truth? Yeah, yeah, family members, people who love you. If they're not willing to tell you the truth, are they really loving you at that time? All of us need people who are willing to step up and tell us an inconvenient truth that we absolutely do not want to hear at the moment. All of us have blind spots. All of us have some things that we're not seeing clearly, and for whatever the reason is, could be self-inflicted, could be self-deception, whatever it may be, we're not seeing it clearly, but there's someone who loves us who will tell us the truth. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Who in your life do you have that they will look at you and they'll say this, are you out of your mind? Now, I don't know if they would say it exactly like that, but they were going to tell you the truth, right? Whether or not you want to hear it or not. You know why? Not that they want to start a fight with you. It's because they love you. Now, when you have to do that, when you have to tell someone the truth, look, it, it, it is not easy, and, and for those of us, when that happens, and I think that's all of us at some point in time, then here's what we need to, here's what happens. People who love you have to guard against their fear, because there may be some truth that you need to hear, but I don't know if I'm the one that wants to deliver it. I, I, I'll just play the what-if game. Well, what if I say that? Then what, what's going to happen, and what if they never you don't want to have anything to do with me again. I mean, there's so many things. There's so much fear that can, can be part of this. But look, if you love somebody, you're willing to tell them the truth. Now, <clears throat> embedded in this is it doesn't mean that you're just obnoxious or a jerk. You don't have to be any of that, right? You can, you can think about, you know, how do I go about this? What's the, what's the right way uh, to, to do this? You can pray for the right way and the right timing. But one of the flashing lights that God places in all of our lives is our people who are willing to tell us the truth. Now, let's go back to verse number three. Now, this is the last half of this verse, and here's Samson's response. Samson said to his father, uh, get her for me, for she pleases me well. Now, this is one of those times I wish we had the audio version of the Bible, because I would love to hear the tone and volume in which this was said. I just got a feeling that uh, there's a little attitude embedded in all of this, Right? Um, look, even though his parents are absolutely right, and Samson knows that his parents are right, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. He's not going to listen to it. And let's, let, let's say this. Remember Samson. Samson is a firstborn, right? No children before Samson. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Samson had brothers and sisters. Maybe he did, probably didn't, which means not only is Samson firstborn, Samson's only. When you read this, don't you get a little sense that uh, Samson is just a little bit spoiled and a whole lot entitled? Because that's what's happened here. So what 
his parents are trying to help him with is to learn from the experience and counsel of others or you're going to learn the hard way. Now, let's take a look at this next verse. This is a good, this is a challenging verse. Here we go. But his father and mother did not know it was of the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines, for at the time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So what happens is in this verse, you just zoom out to big picture, and then you're gonna zoom back in to what's happening right there. Big picture is that Samson had been told by the Lord that he was going to begin to deliver the Israel from the Philistines, although that uh, complete deliverance did not happen within the lifespan of Samson. And so the Lord is looking for that, uh, that opportunity, that occasion, to begin to move the Philistines out of Israel. But what this does not mean, that his father and mother did not know what is of the war, Lord, does that mean that somehow God approved of this? That God is uh, saying, hey, you know what? This is, this is one exemption. It's okay if you sin. It's all right. It's not what it means. Here's, here's what it means. It means this. That what God does is that God works in spite of us. In spite of us. With all of the flaws, with all of the failures, God works uh, in spite of us, often not because of us. As someone once said, why in the world does God use people like Samson? Why does God use sinful people? How come God doesn't get someone better to do what he needs to get done? Well, here's the reason why that God uses sinful people. It's the only people he has. And so you got to take, you got to take it all. And God being sovereign he will do what he is going to do, sometimes in spite of us. Now, let's go back to, uh, now zoom back down to the story We're in verse number five. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother. Now, here's this quick time out here. Uh, his parents give in. His parents give in. His parents knew better. One of the most difficult things in parenting is trying to figure out how to navigate things and what to do and what not to do. And for those of you that uh, you have little children right now, man, we're praying for you. God bless you. You don't get much sleep. You, you need God to help you, right? And there are, there are some, and I remember Becky and I saying this, that, uh, man, when we come to our kids, if we could just get them out of car seats, Oh, man, our life would be so much easier. And then uh, as our kids uh, grew older, they were really good kids, but there were some times we were just going, man, I wish we had like teenage car seats that we could just put them back in, right? That's just the way it works. It's hard. How do you stand for what is right? If your children are still at home and they're a little bit older, what do you allow your children to learn on their own? Where are the lines that can't be crossed? Uh, it's not easy, but scripture, prayer, and with a mo mom and dad, if there is unity between the two, that goes a long way in knowing how to navigate all of this. So they're headed down to the city, and it's only, like I said, about six miles away, and somehow, I don't know exactly what happened, Samson and his parents, they got separated. And uh, here's what we find in the last part of this verse. So Samson, he and came to the vineyards of Timnah. And to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And so uh, here's what happens. Um, he is by the vineyards of Timnah. Now, knowing what we know about the Nazarene, Nazarite vow, is he supposed to be anywhere even near? Oh, what does this mean? Does that mean that he went running into that vineyard, grabbing grapes by the handful and just stuffing them in his mouth? I don't know. I don't think so. Probably not. But here's what I do know. Never should have been there. Never should have been there. 
And because he was there, now look what happens. A young lion came roaring out against him. Now, here's, here's something that we just ought to know. It's a second warning light in Samson's life and in your life, uh, our lives as well. It's this. Samson and we have the warning lights of God grabbing our attention. That's a warning light. So here we are with, with Samson as he's uh, near this vineyard. We now have this young lion that is roaring out against him. And please, don't make the mistake of thinking that this is just a cute little lion cub that comes out, flips on its back, and just wants its belly rubbed. That is not this at all. This young lion is in its prime. He is roaring out against. This lion's full intent was to have a Samson sandwich. And here's what happens, verse number six. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one who would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. The, the Spirit of the Lord comes mightily upon him in, in this circumstance that absolutely grabbed Samson's attention. And because the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, I mean, this is amazing. I mean, he tore the lion apart. I mean, I can't even really imagine what all that, what all happened there. But I'm telling you, it was gruesome, effective, and the threat was eliminated. Here's one reason why I don't think that Samson is uh, a big, muscular guy. I don't think Samson's the guy that's got the 19-inch biceps. I don't think he's the bodybuilder on the cover of a magazine. Because what this says is the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and that's when he possessed the strength to be able to deal with the threat. I'll also fast forward to the time that he's interacting with Delilah, and Delilah is always asking him, hey, what's the source of your strength? What's the source of your strength? What's the source of your strength? Look, if Samson had the 19-inch uh, massive arms and chest, uh, everybody to figure out where the source of his strength was. It's in the, it's in the uh, you know, uh, in the creatine and whatever it was he was taking, all right? <clears throat> so I just think he's an ordinary looking guy. But the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and allows him then to do the things uh, that he could not do uh, on his own. But what we find out is that he doesn't tell mom and dad about what happened which seems to be way out of character. You would just think a guy like Samson with the ego that he seems to possess is like, Mom, Dad, you will never guess what I just did. Oh, yeah, who's the man? <laughs> he does not do that. And I think he doesn't do that because he knows that he had violated a part of his Nazarite vow. This moves on. Look at verse number 7. And he went down and talked with a woman, and she pleased Samson well. So he goes down, has another conversation with her. The arrangements for the wedding are made. And now in verse number 8, it says, And after some time when he returned to get her, so that's that time of the betrothal is now over. You know, when, however long it was, six months, 12 months, however long, he is now going to get her. And he turns aside to see the carcass of the lion. <clears throat> and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of of the lion. So, as he uh, goes to see the place where he had uh, beaten the lion, uh, there is this honey that is there. And what we find is that in verse number nine, it says this, and he took some of it in his hands and went along eating. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So here we go. This is now violating Number two, he's not supposed to have anything to do with anything that is dead. Now, if you zoom out of the story for just a second, the circumstances when it came to this lion was designed to get his attention. It was designed to uh, have him learn a lesson. There was great peril. There was danger. This lion represented a threat that could take his life. And yet, because of the Lord coming mightily upon him, right, he is able to defeat that enemy. 
And the, the, the motivation then from the Lord is, okay, you just saw what's out there. You saw what I can do through you. Now it's time for you to change direction. This line was purposely brought into Samson's life. There are circumstances in your life and in my life that God has brought into our life as well to grab our attention. Can you think of one? Something had happened that you didn't see that was going to happen. You were blindsided by it, but it grabbed your attention. And when it grabbed your attention, was it that circumstance that you said, man, what am I doing? Where am I headed? Where is this going to lead? That's what that unexpected circumstance that God brings into our lives is meant to do. Get your attention. Come on, wake up. Quit moving in the direction that you're moving in. It, it, is, it is so that we will learn some things. So in Samson's life and in our life, in this process, did we learn transparency? Did we, did we say, look, okay, I'm going this direction. That's not the direction I should be going, but I am now going to change directions. But when it came to transparency, Samson hasn't learned that lesson. He didn't tell his parents where the honey came from. And here's just a good rule of thumb, and that's this. Unless a person is willing to be fully transparent, they are not fully transparent repentant. If a person is not willing to lay it all out, to say, okay, here it is. Um, this is all I've got. This is all I've done. Here it is. If they're not willing to do that, if they're still hiding some things, here's what happened. They're sorry. They got caught. And until there's a willingness to be transparent they're just going to figure out how to hide it a little bit better. Samson, did he learn transparency? Did we learn transparency? How about this? Did we learn accountability? In the story, what could have happened was that uh, Samson could have said, Mom, Dad, I've just got something to tell you. I'm sorry. Here's what happened. And uh, I'm asking you to forgive me. But that's not what happened either. He's not willing to be accountable. If a person is unwilling to be accountable, then all they're doing is blowing smoke. All they're doing is trying to deflect the attention from themselves to something else that doesn't matter. And uh, uh, I'm just going to continue to hide reality. Now, this, move, this, this story moves forward. Look at verse number 10. So his father went down to the woman. So now we're gonna, he, he's dealing with uh, her family. And Samson gave a feast there for young men used to do so. This is that seven-day wedding feast that I talked about. Now, what's interesting about this is that this Hebrew word for feast means banquet or drinking party. So in this feast, do you think there's alcohol involved? Well, here's a hint uh, for the young men used to do so. So it's a pretty good safe guess, right? Now, does that mean that Samson got rip-roaring drunk during these seven days? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It doesn't say so, right? But if you had a, if you had a, a dollar to make a bet, would you bet on Samson did drink or Samson didn't drink? I'll tell you where my dollar's going. He absolutely did. Look, did or didn't, the, the problem is this, that he has placed himself in a position of temptation. He has placed himself in a, in a place where it's actually going to be a no one. Can you imagine, let's say he decided not to, what kind of peer pressure do you think is going on with all the rest of the buddies that are happening during a seven-day drinking party? And so here's, <clears throat> this is what happens, right? And that is this, did Samson... Did he learn holiness? Well, I don't think so. When people get in big trouble, it's usually not because they've made one big decision and they find themselves 
in, in all sorts of trouble. Now that can happen, but what usually happens is that's a series of decisions that get them there. The person who says, I would never will, if you make enough small decisions, that will get you there. Here's a great question for all of us, and that's this. Where do you intentionally stay away from? What do you intentionally not do? Who do you intentionally not hang around with? And why? Well, the why is this. Because every time I go there, every time I do this, and every time I hang with that person, nothing good happens. So, if that's the case, then you've got to back away from it. So, here's what Samson does in the middle of all this. Uh, well, actually, at the beginning of it, he is uh, it was part of the party. He's got a riddle for them to, uh, to solve, and he's going to give them seven, seven days to do it. The winner of the riddle, if, uh, if they win, then uh, Samson's going to give them two changes of clothing apiece. So, 60 changes of clothing total. If Samson wins, then they will, each one of them will provide two changes of clothing. So Samson will get 60 changes of clothing. And so he uh, gives them a riddle. Here's the riddle. It's found in verse number 14. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now, for three days, they could not explain this riddle. Look, you could have 103 days, and you're not going to explain this. This is... Some of you are going, that's the worst riddle I've ever heard in my life. Okay. But with hindsight, we get it. So out of the eater, the meat eater lion, came forth something to eat, the honey. Out of the strong, the lion, came something sweet, the honey. So it makes perfect sense looking back on it. But if you're in the middle of this trying to figure this one out, you're having a hard time, which is exactly what they did. Did Samson learn holiness and humility? The humility is this, that uh, out of his sin and violated Nazarite vows, he's, he's making a riddle out of this. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of humility there. And there's just going to get, something is going to get worse for Samson because uh, here's what he didn't see coming. Verse number 15. It came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, so here we go, this is, the, this is the end day. Entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? The idea simply is this, <clears throat> that uh, on this last day, before Samson was going on his honeymoon, they make this threat. And we learned last week that one of the characteristics of the Philistines is that they were savage. But this is no idle threat. They fully intended to carry this out. There's stuff in, that's going on in this story that Samson has no idea about. There's stuff that happens in our lives that we don't have any idea about. And that brings us to this last red flashing light in Samson's life and in our life, and that's this. Samson, or we, have the warning lights of things spinning out of control. There's an old sermon that says that uh, sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And all of that is exactly true. We may think that, uh, that we have some control. Samson has no idea about what is going to happen, but here is what is guaranteed, and that is this, that uh, we're going to lose more than we can imagine. If you keep playing with this stuff, then you're going to lose. It's what happens. Uh, we go down this path, we think we know the destination, but how many stories have you heard about, or perhaps a friend, or a, I hope not family member, 
but they've lost everything because they didn't pay attention to the warning lights. Just look at it real quick. In verse number 18, what you're going to find out is that, uh, hey, they've got the answer because she told them the answer. So what happens? Well, Samson, he lost the bet. He lost the bet. And then uh, look what happens. Here's Samson's response. And he said to them, if you'd not plowed with my heifer, you would have not solved my riddle. Now, that sounds a little odd, doesn't it? <laughs> Probably not the way you'd want to approach stuff, right? But this is kind of an old saying that they had. Uh, the fact is that nobody plowed with a heifer. They plowed with oxen and, and other things. But the idea here is that, um, you know, wow, <laughs> I just said Samson lost his mind by calling his wife uh, a heifer. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. But in more, a more serious note, in verse number 19, you can read it. There's 30 men that die as a result. And so 30 men lose their lives. That's what was lost. And then lastly, in verse number 20, Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. So in all of this, Samson pays off his debt, super mad, storms back home, and the woman's father said, huh, okay, if you're not going to marry her, I want my daughter to have a husband. And so there's the best man. Here you go. So when you read through all of this, our stomach should turn just a little bit. You should, your stomach should just be a little upset. This is an awful story that is about to get way worse in the next chapter. But is it the way that it had to happen? At any point in time, the story could have changed. Samson could have repented. He could have paid attention to uh, that red light. And here's this traffic light. It's a traffic light of people who love you, who will tell you the truth. It is the circumstances that God uses to grab your attention. It is when your life is spinning out of control. It's time to stop which is this, when does it stop? When does it stop? It stops when I choose to make it stop. It stops when I stop and repent and confess my sin, where I'm not going to hide things anymore, I'm gonna be transparent, I'm going to be accountable. I am going to be truly repentant, not because I got caught and I'm sorry. I do it because I have sinned before the Lord and I've sinned against other people and I am truly repentant. And if you don't, if you don't stop it, it'll stop. And you know where it'll stop? At the scene of a crash. Because that's where it inevitably ends up. Here's my last encouragement for all of us. <clears throat> Don't be a Samson. Pay attention to those warning lights that God has placed in your life. And, and if you're here this morning, you're going, well, I think I'm okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not involved in, in the things that we were talking about here. Then let this be an encouragement to you to place in the back of your mind so that when the time does come, you will have already learned the lessons that Samson should have learned. And if there's one person, maybe here, maybe online, that this story is describing you, can I just beg you for your, on your behalf and for your family's behalf to stop, to stop, to repent, to change direction, to do something different, to get help, to talk to somebody, and don't end up in the same place that Samson ended up. There is grace that God gives, and it's abundant.
but you can cross a point of no return. Do something different before that happens. Let's pray together. Lord, we are uh, we're challenged by this because um, <clears throat> we have no exemption to this. Not a single person in this room that uh, could say, ah, that would never happen to me. Or it could happen to all of us if we make the same uh, decisions that Samson did. And Lord, I, I don't know people's hearts. Uh, everything is uh, clear before you. And so, Lord, if there's somebody that needs to hear this and heed this and pay attention to that flashing red light, Lord, I pray that this is the day that they take that first step. They, they say that prayer. They uh, talk to somebody. And Lord, that uh, the uh, <clears throat> trajectory of their life changes. Lord, we're thankful that you give us that opportunity. We're thankful for your grace. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> now, here's an email address uh, for sure. Also, just before we're dismissed, uh, when you came in the lobby, you saw the Christmas tree that is there, and that's our angel tree. There are little paper angels on that tree that represent uh, people within the military who are in need of some assistance uh, over Christmas. And uh, we're working through uh, Dr. Tom Westall, as we've done all of these years, we're also working through uh, everybody out at the base, and these families are identified, and they're targeted, and they, we know who they would be, and so uh, we want to uh, be a help. So you can pick up one of those cards for either a food box or a gift, and uh, you can do that out in the lobby. Then I also just want to bring you to your attention that uh, next Sunday we're going to be receiving communion. And so I always like to let you know in advance that that's what we will be doing. And so uh, we'll, uh, we'll receive that uh, next Sunday. Let's all stand. If you came prepared to uh, give an offering, thank you for your generosity. You can do so at the boxes uh, at the, all of the exits. And I just want to thank you for being here. And as we leave, let's all be encouraged and let's all be challenged that whatever the red light is in our lives, it's got our attention. We're going to make a different choice. And uh, I know absolutely God will bless as a result. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you. We'll see you back next Sunday.